Gospels to Luke, if you would please. We're preaching our way through the Gospel of Luke. And today, and Brother Stellmaker enjoyed it when I said we're going to finish off Satan. And uh, and, uh, uh, would be nice, wouldn't it, to think we could finish off Satan. Now, the Bible says soon we will trample him under our feet, right? God has promised that to his people. We will trample Satan. Where does that say that in the Bible? In the Bible. Good job. Yes. Where does it say in the Bible? In the Bible. I believe it's Romans 16, isn't it? I think it is. It says the promise that we will trample him under our feet. And that's a great. Uh, Luke chapter number four. I know we're camping here for a little bit, but uh, it's so awesome. All right. And I have a hard time getting away from this. Uh, I have this imagination thing. And uh, it led me astray for years. You know, I like swords and sorceries, and I like that kind of stuff. And I like uh, witches, ghouls, and goblins, and, and, and you know, d dungeons and dragons and stuff like that. And it led me astray for years. did a lot of damage in my heart. God got me right. It got me interested in the fact that there's a lot of that in your Bible. You know, there's a lot of spiritual things in here that we don't understand. The Bible warns us, though, of people who speak of those things which they know not. And uh, you got to be careful what you say heaven is. Uh, you don't know a lot, right? Be careful. When you're preaching on angels, demons as they're called, or devils, or Satan and the devil, we don't want to go beyond what's written. The Bible warns us about going beyond what's written. But we can use deductive and inductive reasoning. And I know you guys are just, you know, prime on the inductive and deductive reasoning. And uh, looking within or looking without, bringing pieces together, exterior pieces, you know, inductive or deductive, inductives within, deductives without. And we, and you know, if this is this and this is true, then this must be true. That's you know, that that's that's you know, you're deductive, right? You can do that. How many can do that, right? If this is true and this is true, then this must be true, right? And uh, that's that's something you can do, an inductive comparing things inside, what's inside the text, and bringing it out and saying, this must have happened. Uh, that's where things in our Bible are implied, or something must be true. If this is true, and the Bible says it is, then this must be true. The Bible doesn't say it, but it must be. You know, that's, that's more of an inductive kind of thing. And you can do that with your Bible, and you have to. You have to. And you do it all the time when you read your Bible. Okay, we just got to be careful, right? We don't want to go beyond the text and make stuff up. <laughs> right? We don't want to do that. And we don't want to go extra biblical, which means you go to the book of Enoch or the book of Jasher, and that's where a lot of your, your teaching comes uh, from uh, Genesis chapter 6, where we're going to end up eventually. Um, a lot of that comes from those books, and, and we can reference them as historical things. They are old, they're there, but they're not canon. Right, and we don't take them as true, and I don't even like to go in and, and look at them because it, you start getting pictures in your mind. That's why I don't like watching movies about Christ. It brings a picture to your mind. This is enough, right? This is enough, and uh, and I can trust this. But we're in Luke chapter number four. We are studying a battle between who and who. God and Satan. Yes. Yes, I, I made something a little more specific. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman and the serpent and Satan. The seed of the woman and Satan. Now, this isn't the seed of Satan. This is Satan coming. And it is my firm belief, and I'm backed up by many theologians and probably the vast majority uh, maybe a vast majority, but definitely the majority would say Satan at this time did not know who Jesus was. I always think of that song whenever I hear that. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Right? Are you thinking that now? You got to tune? He's more than just a story. He is the king of glory. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Boy, you guys are lame today. I, I need to start going, yeah, I know the song. How many know the song? That's it? Nobody knows that song? Well, no wonder you're lame. All right. Um, uh, it's, it's a great little tune, right? Why? Because confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. If you can't confess your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you don't know he's Lord. You don't know he's the king of glory. You don't know he's God come in the flesh. Who's the king of glory? Psalm chapter 2, right? Who is the king of glory? Mighty <laughs> to save, right? Who is that? It's Jesus Christ opened unto me the gates of righteousness. I will come in. Wow. Okay. Anyway, the king of glory. Uh, Jesus Christ is 
the hypostatic union, God and man combined completely. There's no separation. He's not a man indwelt by God. No, no, he's not indwelt by the Christ. The word became flesh. Now, nobody saw this coming, right? Why? Because it's a mystery. What are we studying now? The mystery of what? Godliness, right? 1 Timothy 3.16, or is it 2.15? Or is it 2.15 or 3.15 or 2 Timothy 3.15? Anybody get all those confused? <laughs> There's a bunch of them. Uh, 1 Timothy, what is it, 3.16 says, uh, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The Bible says, in him was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's a man who is God. Is he omnipresent? Well, yeah. Is he omniscient? Yeah. Is he omnipotent? Yes. Does all power dwell? Yes, he's God. He can't stop being God. But he's a man. And he sits next to you and eats fish. You know what? What manner of man is this? The disciples didn't get it. It wasn't until long after Jesus ascended that they started realizing at that end time, a couple of disciples started coming to it. And they started realizing he's God. And Thomas kneels down and says, my Lord and my God. And Peter looks at him and says, Lord, you know all things. And that's when Jesus said, you're reinstated to the ministry, my son. You figured it out. He's God. And he's walking among us. <laughs> who would have thunk it, right? Nobody did. Nobody knew it was coming. And guess who else didn't know it was coming? The other realm that we don't know a whole lot about. It's kind of dark and shadowy. But the Bible gives us insights, right? About a king of Grecia f- fighting and a prince fighting and, and, and how, how Gabriel couldn't answer Daniel's prayer for 21 days because he was, was held by some power that's called the, the prince of Grecia. And there was a battle taking place. And Daniel prayed and fasted. And God sent the answer to his prayer the day he started praying. But prayer didn't get there for three weeks. Why? Because somebody was hindering it. Who was it? We don't even know who it was. But he's strong enough to stop Gabriel. And Gabriel said, until Michael, your angel, came and helped me overcome him, I finally made it. Three-week battle. Who can stop Gabriel from doing the will of God? The prince of Grecia. Who is he? Now he talks about others that come. The prince of Persia is coming. And Gabriel says, I'm going back to battle. See you later, Daniel. <laughs> What's that about? What's going on? What do we see, right? Well, we see shadows in here, what it is, right? Now you have uh, uh, the seed of the serpent, right? He's told in Genesis 3.15, Satan's judgment, right? I put enmity between thee and the woman. Right? Not many women like snakes. <laughs> right? I put enmity between Satan and the woman. Oh, you poor ladies. God put a war between you and the devil. You feel it in your brain? <laughs> ladies fight. I mean, ladies and the devil. Wow. And between her seed and thy seed. And the entire angel host went, what? Satan is going to have a seed? They'd never heard of that. Angels can't procreate. What is God talking about? And thou shall, well, thou shall bruise his heel, and it shall bruise thy head. Satan, you're going to lose, but you're going to do some damage. The forecast is given, Genesis 3.15. The rest of the Bible is the outworking. And what do we see at the end? The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Is this the seed of the woman? Is this who it was? Satan won the first contest against mankind. Now he's looking at the second. I think Satan walks away from this day going, he ain't like the first one. <laughs> Woo! The battle takes place. Who's battling? Well, we, two weeks ago we went over the hypostatic union. God. Okay. Now, whenever God's on one side, the other side's going to lose. <laughs> right? We know that. It, there's no contest. Right? There's no contest here. We're not biting our nails thinking, who's going to win? I don't know. No, there's no nervousness here. Jesus isn't like, whew, oh, better work out for this one. No, <laughs> he's not worried, okay? He's the creator of all things. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's, he knew this was coming how long ago? 
right? Right? He didn't have to practice. He knows the thoughts of every angel, demon, Satan. But Satan's not. And Satan's coming here. And he saw the baptism. And he saw the descent of the Holy Spirit. And so did the entire angelic host. That he saw Jesus walk, walk from where he was baptized, depending on where you think it was. There's about three spots over on the Jordan. They think Jesus was baptized into the wilderness, which is over towards the Arabian Desert. So he headed east. And according to my Bible in the back and the little scale there, he walked about 60 miles into the wilderness. towards Decapolis, out in the middle of nowhere. And he headed out. 60 miles? Yeah, see, this isn't something like, like, you know, he walked over to a backyard somewhere. No, Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And Satan's watching him, and he's coming. And then what happened according to Mark? We didn't read Mark, but Mark tells us what? The animals all gathered around Jesus. They love their creator. They love their creator. When he walks along the world, they come to him. <laughs> They're not afraid of him, and he's not afraid of them, right? Animals always obey their creator throughout the entire Bible. Every animal obeys its creator, right? But Jesus walks through them. It says the wild animals came to him. Which ones? How many? Do you picture the scene? Jesus is walking 60 miles out into the wilderness. He's walking over into Arabia. Here's, here's Israel. Let's do it your way. Here's Israel, and, uh, and he's heading off into the desert. Over here is the Mediterranean. He's heading off, and he walks out into the desert. How long did it take him? How fast can you walk 60 miles? And he heads over that way. And he's just heading over that way. Uh, it's a, a little over a month, a month and 10 days. 40 days he's out there wandering in the wilderness. Sound familiar? You know anybody else that wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? And uh, he's wandering out there in the wilderness. And, and there's a scapegoat that goes out in the wilderness. You might want to look at the types. Well, I don't know if we're going to get to types and symbols here, but wow. So off Jesus goes into the wilderness. And Satan's watching. Now Satan steps in. Why does he wait 40 days? Hmm. <laughs> you want to look at the types and symbols. Why at 40 days? Does the battle, it says he was tempted the whole time, but why at 40 days? And Jesus is walking, and the animals are coming out to greet their creator as he walks through. It says he was with the wild beast. Right? Doesn't eat or drink anything. And Satan shows up. Right? What's he want to find out? Is he the one? So this is what Satan is doing here. So we got the angelic host here. And, uh, and who's watching? Think Gabriel's watching? Think Michael? We know at the end, Luke says the angels came and ministered to him. What did they do? How do you minister to God? What, what happened? They show up. We know angels can show up and give you food. Right? <laughs> Maybe they brought him lunch. Pizza? Dominoes. What do the angels do? The angels show up at the end. So you know the angels are watching, right? Do they want to help? They got, they got their hands on the hill? They know this is the chosen one of God. Did the angels know it was God? The angels, according to Peter, were looking into this. They didn't understand it. They did not understand the mystery of godliness. When the angels looked in heaven, did they still see Jesus? Is he omnipresent? John says he was in chapter 3. The same Son of God that's on earth is in heaven at the same time. Remember, he's God. If you ever have a theological position that says Jesus was less than God, you're wrong. He's always more than God. That's why I won't watch The Passion of Christ. Why? It's making him less than God. He's never scared. He's in control of everything. His crucifixion is where David dug the hole and put the skull of Goliath. Who do you think planned that? David dug the hole for the cross. Did you know that? Who led him where? Did they try to lead him over here? And Jesus said, no, there. <laughs> Karen's cross. I said it there. <laughs> Who's in charge of this thing anyway? Who's in charge? Satan certainly isn't. He's going to find out later. He's going to find out later. So what's happening here, right? Well, now here comes a being called Satan. Well, to understand it, we're going to do a little study of Satan. Now, what we don't want to do is glorify Satan. Right? Right? But we do want to glorify God. And how do we glorify God through Satan? Well, let's understand what God created originally. 
and then see what happened. Now, how many of you would say, I know what text you're going to today because you're going to study Satan, his creation, his fall? Uh, Eli does, okay. All right. Anybody? I'm not going to ask you to name it, but you're pretty sure you know what text to go to. All right, good. Uh, well, not good, but I mean, you know. So uh, I was right in assuming that a lot of people, might, once you go there, you'd be like, yeah, I know this text. I just don't know where it was. Okay. So let's read Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And uh, if, if you don't mind, again, if you want to sit, that's fine. But if you can stand for the reading of God's word, I invite you to do that. Um, you're not less of a Christian if you don't stand. You can sit down, Mrs. Gould. You, you, your leg is just healing. It's okay, all right? If it hurts, sit down, okay? It's fine. It's, it's perfectly fine. Pain is not something that is, is commendable to God, okay? You don't have to wear barbed wire to make God happy, as Martin Luther, as Martin Luther did. Martin Luther wore barbed wire around his chest underneath his robe, just, you know, try to make God happy. He figured out that was wrong. Father, bless the reading of thy word. Help us to glorify thy holy name today. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, for, for you, you Bible people, the Jordan descends. The word means descent. It means descent into death. It's the idea of dying. The Jordan always represents death. You don't want to catch that. Where was he coming from? Where is he going? Why did he go into it? Where did he come out? The picture's there. So, so those of you that enjoy that kind of stuff, it's wonderful. And he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. And you want to put the scapegoat next to that. And, and being 40 days tempted of the devil, <clears throat> and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. What's Jesus hungry for? You might, right next to that, John 6, 48. We saw that last week, and oh, two weeks ago. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone uh, that it be made bread. And Jesus answered, saying, It is written. That man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. The devil, taking him up to a, unto a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power I will give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him into Jerusalem, and set him in the, in the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thy, thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee. And in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Boy, you should write Genesis 3.15 next to that. Why does Satan bring it up? And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all temptation, he departed from him for a season. Thank you, Lord, for the text. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I try to do it justice. I try to uh, bring out a little bit and get your whistle wet for what's here to look further. We know the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and how that temptation comes. But it's far beyond. It's more like that. God intends to kill you. True life. Uh, what is life? Where is the origin of life? That is the battle. That's why Jesus brings up life by the word of God. Does Satan know he's facing life itself? I am the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is life. Life is defined by God as Jesus Christ. Not whether or not your heart's beating. It's defined by Jesus Christ. That's what life is defined by. Satan's coming in and challenging the definition of life and what life is. He's talking about existence here and how something exists. He, he says you have the ability, prove it, to command. Commands if you're truly the son of God command this since you say since it said you were the son of god since i heard a voice from heaven saying you're the son of god command it make it command the transformation from organic to inorganic let's go ask a physicist let's go ask a, 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 a botanist let's go ask what would it take to change a stone to bread what's the chemical makeup what atoms have to change what has to be added what has to be subtracted what does it mean to go from something that's inorganic to organic? And why would Satan use that as a test? And why does there a particular stone here? Matthew says it's stones. Let's, say, let's just say he's pointing to a group of stones. Change it. Command it to change. 
commanded to change. There's a lot of uh, theologians out there that say there's two Edens. There was an Eden in heaven that Satan was in charge of, and Lucifer at that time, and there's an Eden on earth. Uh, and the, the Eden that was on earth is a transformed Eden, the Eden that was taken from Satan and transformed. It was transformed from a stone in burning stones into uh, an organic Eden. And, and as it came out of the earth, out of the stone and the powder and the dust that was left over after the fall of Satan, he brought up out of that the Garden of Eden. And Satan knows that Adam is his replacement. What do you think Satan thought when he was looking around the angelic host and he's looking around the seraphims and the, and the cherub of what he is? None of them made in the image of God. And God out of the clay makes something, breathes into it, and up it rises, and he's in the very image of God. No angels made in the image of God. Satan's looking at Adam and Satan's seeing what's coming up. There's a garden placed here that he was not the master of, but he knows who the master of it is. And it's Adam standing there made in the image and likeness of God. Then God says to that man, he says, multiply. And Satan knows he doesn't have the ability, no, no, neither do any of the angels, none of them. We, he knows right then and there, if they're allowed to survive, there's no possible way they could ever win the battle. Why? They can multiply. An innumerable number can come out of that man, but out of us, there's a finite level. We can't multiply. Do you understand what's going on in the angelic world when Adam was created? There's a challenge. There's a challenge. Satan thought he was up to it. He didn't know God was going to get involved. <laughs> Amen. He took not upon him the nature of angels, the Bible says, when Jesus came to earth. He didn't come to redeem them. He took upon him the seed of Abraham. God was going to step into man's behalf. Satan didn't know this. So here we see the test coming in. So the, the first challenge has, has to do with the challenge of life. It's the idea of life and the involvement of life. Is life existence and is existence life? Are they co-together? All you got to do to find the lie of Satan, listen to the atheist. You cease to exist at the end of your life. And God says, no, 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 that's not how I define life. I don't define it by existence. You will exist forever. Life is Jesus Christ. Your existence does not end and will never end. But that's not life. Satan says, oh yeah? Let's talk about life. Talk about the origin. Did God really give you life? What is life? What is the life force? What is it that's in you that separates you from organic? Change the stone to bread. What's your source of life? See, there's something happening deeper here. It's, it's, it goes much further than that. If, you, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you want to study further into what the challenge is here, let me know. And uh, we can study a little further. Listen, one layer, two layers, three. It's not just the lust of the flesh. Are you hungry? Here's some bread. No, that is part of it. Absolutely. But it's also a challenge on the existence of life. What happened to the next one? We know the next one has to do with an authority challenge. It's the purpose of autonomy. Are you your own being? Uh, who is in charge, rule and reign? Uh, you were meant for greatness. You were meant for this. And you'll see this when he comes to Eve uh, with the ability, what it's meant to do. And it's the idea of authority, authority over you. And, uh, and he's coming to challenge the idea of authority. And uh, yes, <laughs> How many of you know that that's the problem in our world today? It has to do with authority. I'm going to move quickly through this. We went through it a couple of weeks ago. Um, then comes the last one, the pride of life. We know this is the idea. You step off the temple, you know, and uh, what's going to happen. But we know uh, the, the idea behind the whole thing is free will. He's challenging the fact that you are predestined. You are determined. You can't do anything yourself. You have no free will. No such thing. It's what he challenged Eve with, with authority and then with free will. You have free will. Exert your free will. Step off this temple. Prove to me you have free will. How? By falling to the bottom and dying. God will have to intervene. Proving you don't really have any free will. You can't do anything. You, yourself. He challenges the free will. Boy, I tell you what, if there's anything under attack today, it's free will. Scientists are coming out and saying the predetermination, and we are determined, and there is no such thing as free will. If you don't actually exist and you're nothing more than a chemical process, you have no free will. There's no such thing. You are predetermined by your chemicals to do what you're going to do, be who you're going to be, act the way you act. Every action and everything you have can be done by a pill today. All your feelings are pills. Therefore, it's just a chemical reaction. You're not really you. You're not even a person. You don't exist. 
Satan's lie is prevalent today in churches. Satan's lie is prevalent, prevalent today in atheism and in our sciences and in our philosophies. Existence isn't real. Life ceases at existence. You have actually no authority of anything and your free will does not exist. That's what he did to Eve. That's what he's trying to do. And we can study that out. It's, it's amazing as you look through your Bible. The exertion of free will and how it comes to prove you've got it. Wow. It's, it's there. It's awesome study. Awesome study. I, I'd suggest if that's something that perks your brain up and you want to get a little deeper into Luke chapter 4 here in the beginning of it, I would suggest some good reading to you. And uh, you can go into some good stuff. Uh, 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 Was it Henry Morris? Well, hey, you want to read some of his stuff, right? Good, good stuff. You'll like it. Uh, theologians dig deep into this stuff. So what happens now? Let's take a look at what we're looking at as two creatures, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, no. Creator and one creature. But we want to understand. We understand who Christ is. He's God. Who is Satan? Who is Lucifer? Let's see. I had a... Uh, some principles written here I remind you of. One is, is the fact that uh, uh, you must bind the strong man before you can spoil his good. Jesus talks about this. Who's the strong man? That's Satan. Who's the one binding? That's God. God must first enter in and bind Satan before he can spoil his goods, and he's going to do that. When does he do it? I want you to tell me. When does God bind Satan? When does he come in and spoil Satan's goods? And who is the strong man? <laughs> and uh, how is Satan likened unto the strong man? He's a thief to begin with. He's the strong man that got all his goods by thievery. You might recognize some of this as some of God's people in the past have gotten their goods as, as uh, through thievery, breaking into villages and stealing what they have. And, and God says, how do you take away somebody's spoil? You bind the strong man. And who's, who's the one doing the binding? That's God. He's going to give us thoughts throughout the scriptures about it. Um, about the binding of the strong man. So let me organize a few thoughts here as we go through it. And uh, <laughs> look at this. That's Wednesday night. <laughs> I tried to write down a few thoughts that I had uh, to try to organize them. Take your Bible and go to Ezekiel chapter 28. There's my organized thoughts of Ezekiel 28. And I said, you know what? I can organize this better. And I didn't outline it, but I just organized it better. Life free will, good and evil. That's the first three temptations. Is God's the origin of evil? Um, he's the source of evil. It's always part of Satan's lie. Um, we've got lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, uh, life's origin, the goodness of God, and the free will. That's the authority. God doesn't have the right to have authority. That's, that's the origin of evil. Um, it's also free will. It's the origin of evil. God is evil. When somebody says, what about the babies that die? What about the heathen? What are they saying? God is evil. He's unjust to send a man to hell who's never heard the name of Jesus. That makes God evil. What are they accusing God of? Satan's lie. And that's what he's going to come in and try. A lot of people won't go to heaven because of somebody they never met, never known, never heard of, but they think of some heathen that might go to heaven or go to hell. Some heathen's going to go to hell, so therefore God, God's unjust. I won't accept your God. You know, what do you say to somebody like that? Go, go check out the heathen. Let's go. Let's go to check out the aborigines. Let's find out what they know about good and evil. We'll decide whether or not God is fair. The missionary that felt such compassion and went over to, to Africa to the villages after he saw the slideshow and said, oh, so much, so de deprivation. They've never heard the name of Jesus. They've never heard. They're just these innocent people sitting back. And he said he went there and found out they hate God. He found out they love sin. He found out that those people in those grass huts are just as hard as the Americans. They know what's right. They know what's wrong. And he found out that John chapter 3 is true. Men love darkness. And they will not come to the light. There's no aborigines that goes to hell unfair. God is just. Your ignorance in believing Satan's lie, making God unfair. That's the problem. See, and that's what happens. That's the test of Satan. That's what Satan is testing Jesus with. If you can understand, the origin of evil is one of the keys of Satan's lies. And uh, here we have, uh, we're going to study the origin of Satan. So let's find out his origin and his place. I just wrote down his place, his sin, and then his, uh, his sinful rebellion, and then we have 
his, his fall. So let's just go through this very quickly. Um, I made a list here of the stones inside of Satan's body, and then I likened that to the stones that are in the foundation of the city of, of God called his bride, because they both have these foundation stones. I circled the stones that are the same, and I'm trying to find the stones that are different and see what God has to say about these stones. See, that's what you call Bible study. You want to do stuff like that, right? Is there any place else the Bible has a group of stones like this? Yeah, in the foundation of heaven. If the foundation of heaven has all these stones in it, the decorate, why does Satan? And why does God like these stones? And are they physical? Is a diamond physical? Does Satan have a physical side? What is it about stones? Huh, it's it, y'all thought that stuff, right? Y'all look in your Bible and go, huh, I wonder what that means. Ha, huh, I wonder if it's somewhere else. And how many ever do that and come to a blank and go, I don't know. I circled them all. I see down here in my notes, I circled the different, these are the stones that match between the two of them. And I haven't finished that Bible study yet, so I can't share it with you. I don't know what it means yet. I don't know. Maybe it means nothing. What happens if you come to the end and go, <laughs> well, you had a good time studying your Bible, right? That's what you had. And uh, but first of all, I got to go into the Greek and Hebrew names for the stones. Now I got to go to the Greek and Hebrew, find out if some of the names have just changed, and it's a, it's a translation from Hebrew, and one's a translation of Greek. Maybe the same stone is mentioned more often than I think. But there's only ten stones in Satan. There's twelve stones in the foundation. And what do the numbers represent? Now you got to go to numerology. What does ten represent in the Bible? What does twelve represent in the Bible? Ah, oh, isn't that fun? Don't you want to study your Bible? Well, let's talk about Satan, right? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. And uh, we're in church, we're going to talk about Jesus. Well, we're going to talk about how Jesus created Satan. Remember, this is God's creation. So Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11 through 15, his place, 15a, which means you can't read the last part. <laughs> Moreover, it says, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now, the king of Tyrus is, is a type of Satan, and here it's a powerful type in this section, um, pretty much hands down by any Bible scholars who, who are, are Bible literalists like we are, who study and read their Bible, say this is Satan. And it's a typology here using the king of Tyrus. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God. Now, this is about Satan. Thou sealest up the sum. This is his original state, which means what? That term is the idea of Satan is the greatest being God ever created. Okay? Of the angelic host, now here at this time, of course, when he's created, there is none of us. We're not created yet. Um, when he created that, thou sealest up the sum. Thou art the greatest. Thou art the top. Of the angelic host, the greatest one, is Satan, or Lucifer here would be um, at that time. Um, so he is the pinnacle, top dog, the big chief. Now, for you guys coming to a morning Bible study, we're going to find out why in Jude, Michael the archangel doesn't dare stand against Satan. He doesn't dare bring a railing accusation. Why not? Because Satan's above him. Satan was above it. And it says in Jude, it gives us a little glimpse into the Satan in the, into the world where Lucifer, he's not going to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan. Why not? Well, if we won't get there today probably, but we find out in chapter 12 of Revelation, Satan's already deceived a third of the angels. You want to try to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him? Michael says, he dares not, he did not dare but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. He said, let God handle you. Michael's smart enough not to talk to Satan. Some of your TV preachers aren't. Of course, we got a good debate going on Sunday morning, by the way. Joe brought up something good. You got to, or Saturday morning, you got to come to men's Bible study. We start talking about the authority of the believer, the difference of a believer has more authority than, a, than, a, than, a, than an angel. Do we? Oh, yeah, we studied that in Ephesians chapter 2, remember? Seated at the right hand of God. Anyway, uh, come to morning, Saturday morning Bible study, and we'll get into some cool stuff. It says, Thus saith the Lord, thou sealest up the sum. Notice this, full, full of wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom seeing the world the way God does. That's wisdom. Seeing the events the way God sees the events. The more you have the mind of God, the wiser you are. Wisdom is thinking like God, all-wise God he is. This creature that he created is full 
of wisdom. Now we know that when he after the fall, that wisdom after he fell, that's a that's a crooked wisdom. But understand what wisdom is: understanding the ways of God. What's it mean to be full of it? Nobody understands God's ways like this creature. He understands God's ways. Full of it. Full of wisdom. What happens when you do this? Then you go back. The creator is talking to the wisest, most powerful, top angel ever created. And you think you can understand the conversation? That they're talking in baby language. Goo goo? No, no, it's not goo goo gaga, okay? Now, God's word is written on a surface level. You can read it, and it doesn't change. It's not esoteric, it's not secret. It, what it says is true lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. But now you get a little deeper and a little deeper. These two are talking at some levels. And what's transpiring between the seed of the woman and Satan is hard to grasp and it's going to take you all over the Bible. As you follow the, the seed of the woman in his life and you follow the seed of the serpent who is Judas, you got to go back to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 11, when you start finding the good shepherd, the wicked shepherd, the idle shepherd, and what they're going to do, they understood what they were doing. And there's stuff happening behind the scenes that, wow, what a study. We probably won't go in that deep, but it is fun to study. This is where he was. Full of wisdom. Now look at the last part. And perfect in beauty. Now if God says he's perfect in beauty, what do you look like? Could you imagine seeing him? Would you just go, wow. Perfect in beauty. That's, this is him, right? This is him. He seals up the sum. He's full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. What a blessed place he had. He was the top of all that God had created. The pinnacle, right? It says in verse number 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, some theologians argue which garden that is. I don't. I'm, I'm not one to take to the, to the, uh, the garden pre, predating this garden, that there was two gardens, one for Satan, one for uh, um, Adam. And, uh, I've always taken that just as he was in the garden, and we know that he was, he's ancient, he's in that garden. But maybe I'm wrong. They haven't convinced me yet. I'm studying it. They haven't convinced me yet. I've read several scholars, just like I'm reading another book right now about the immortality of the animals. And they haven't convinced me yet. You know? But I like to read them. My wife's like, Shh, I keep telling her stuff I'm reading. She's like, that's stupid. And, uh, <laughs> that's not true. I don't know. I want my puppy dog to live forever. And uh says, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. As a coat, as, as it says, the, the, the foundation is covered. It's something to put around and decorate every. But it says that they're inside of him. And he lists the stones, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, and the, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the uh, carbuncle, and the gold. It says, and the workmanship of thy tambrets and of thy pipes. Now, some theologians dis dis uh, argue about what these two things mean. Tambrets seem to be clearly a tambourine, an a, a instrument type, inst but the pipes are, are more like holes that are inside of him. There's holes. They call them pipes because they, they, they list with the, with the tambrets. Um, they both seem to be musical, making the musical instruments made with inside of him. But there's another way to understand is also um, that he has holes and sockets built within him that fit all these stones. And the phone stones are actually inside of his being and part of him, and they're created with them inside of him. Um, I like the one here because tambrets doesn't really fit in that. It seems clearly a musical instrument, so there's a change here that he's covered with this, and then inside of him is the music. And we and, and because of this, we believe he was the song leader of heaven. He he protected the. Uh, he, he's we're gonna learn later. He's a cherub. He's not an angel. He's a cherub, which is a certain type of heavenly being, but he's not necessarily what they call angels. He's a cherub, which means what? Cherubs have one place in heaven. Cherubs are the protectors of God's holiness. They protect things of God. Remember the Garden of Eden? He put a cherub outside that faced every direction with a fiery sword. He protected the garden that man couldn't go back in. They protect things. That's what the cherub do. Cherub are weird looking. They're all uh, covered with eyes. They got all these strange things around them, right? Then you got the seraphim who have the six wings. and They're part of the throne of God. And they got four heads facing different directions. Weird creatures. They're not made in the image of God. Okay, these guys are weird. All right, uh, what Satan looks like is this is all we have. He's got built within him all these beautiful stones, and he just glows as it comes out of him. And uh, um, he's a cherub, 
and he's a protector, and we believe his location was above, if this is God's throne, above. Uh, when he sees God's throne in Ezekiel chapter 1, above God's throne is just an empty spot now. But we're going to find that Lucifer is called the cherub that covereth or spreadeth or covers. And it talks about the, his spread was splendor. The size of this being's wings, we have no idea. But we know they cover the top of God's throne from one side to the other side. Maybe the entire sea of glass surrounding God's throne is covered by the wings of this protector of God's praise. The highest creature ever filled with stones, glowing and just Splendor, it's going to say. He's just splendor to look at. Perfect in beauty. Full of wisdom. The music comes out of his body as he leads the angelic host in praise to God. This is the creature that God created. Notice the end of verse 13. It says, The tabrets of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Twice he's going to remind us here he's a creature. <laughs> How far is he from God? infinite. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, if you know anything, we've got, uh, God says to Moses, make the ark. And he says on each side of the mercy seat, put a cherubim and their wings are to cover. And we know that this is a likeness of heaven. There's a cherub named Lucifer whose wings spread and cover. And this is, what, this is what Satan was. Now we get the place of where he was, the privileged position, what he was, dynamic and incredible, this creature. All right? It says, uh, thou art the anointed. That means the chosen one. You are the chosen cherub that covereth. Your place of privilege is above all, and I have set thee so. God says, this is my doing. Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? <laughs> you, know, you might want to. Doesn't that do something to you when you start seeing other Bible ties together? I have set thee so. This isn't mistakes. God never's made one. Never. This is free will. And it says, "Thou is upon the holy mountain of God. Thou has walked up." And down. Notice he walks. Notice he's upon. Notice he covers. Notice his place in the midst of the stones of fire. And that's where you get out that this Eden that he was in was actually a fiery Eden of stone. That, he, that his fall, God wiped it out and brought out of that same Eden an organic Eden. He turned it to dust. And out of that dust, are we created from the dust of Satan's very own Eden? Why does God say to Satan or to the serpent, dust thou shalt eat? You ever wonder why? When Satan watched Adam be made out of dust, and then he says, dust thou were, Adam, dust thou shalt return, and you're going to eat the dust. See, there's more to what we our Bible, don't we think? It, there's tie-ins here, okay? Remember, remember your body? Everything is linked. Throw off one peptide in your body and watch what happens. You don't even know what a peptide is, and neither do I. They just had to scan them for me and found one was off. It immediately said, that could be cancer. Man, sent me down for a CT scan. <laughs> oh, never mind. You're fine. <laughs> ah! Right? Why? Because yeah, what's a peptide? I don't know. And the guy taking the blood test said, peptide panel? What's that? <laughs> they had to call the doctors. Doctors had to call them to figure out what to do. Why? Our bodies are so complicated. Everything's tied together. We are just getting started trying to understand it. And the God that made your body wrote a book. Think it's complicated? Think it ties together in ways that we don't understand? Think when we get to heaven, God's going to say, let me show you something. Here's one page. It'll be 45, 50 years, but let's go through this one page. <laughs> right? The stones of fire, what are they? Are they? Is that the glassy sea around us? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Somebody help me. Um, I'm trying to find out. If I figure it out, I'll let you know. Um, look at verse 15a. That means the beginning. Don't read the end. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created. How long was that? Raise your hands. Uh, how long did Satan per serve God faithfully, perfectly? How long? A thousand years? Who thinks it's a thousand years or less? 
He said, that was perfect in the day that that was created. How long did he serve God perfectly? How long did he lead the angelic host wonderfully? There's a hint. I'll tell you a hint. There's a beautiful guy, just gorgeous. Every year they cut his hair. It was like five pounds. And through the abundance of his traffic, he led a rebellion against his father. I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. How long? And then what happened? It was what happened here. So there we have, there's his place. This is who he is. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. All right, you're going too slow. We're going to hurry up. Ready? Isaiah chapter 14. I went the wrong way. <laughs> Isaiah, but how many knew we were going to go to Isaiah 14 and we were going to go to Ezekiel 28? That's where we talk about Satan. Uh, Isaiah 14, verse uh, number 12. If you know those two texts, then you've done some study on Satan. You may have forgotten them, but you've read these ones. This is where we get into Satan's uh, I wills, and we're probably going to have to stop there today. Um, but no, we can't. We can't stop with Satan. We've got to stop with God. So it says, Satan's sin. What happened to Satan? Just keep your spot in Isaiah. We're going to go back to Isaiah. So don't lose your spot in Isaiah. Notice i got two fingers. You want to do that. So uh, chapter uh, 14 of Isaiah, verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O shining one, O beautiful one? Lucifer means shining one. Unless you have the wrong Bible. If it says something else, come see me. Son of the morning. The word star is a very particular word in the Hebrew, and it does not exist in this text. If your Bible has any kind of a star there, let me know. Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? What did he do? What happened? What happened? All right, now, you got your spot there. Look over, okay, at uh, Ezekiel 28, 17. What happened? So we keep your spot there in Isaiah. Don't lose it. What He was cut down to the ground. What happened? It said in verse uh, Ezekiel 28, 17, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou was corrupted by thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. That word brightness is also translated splendor. Right? So what happened? His heart became lifted up. Why? Because of his beauty and splendor. That's what happened. Well, what happened over here? Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. What is the sin of Satan lifting up in his heart? What, what happened? His beauty and splendor. He looked in the mirror. Oh, that we could get rid of all mirrors. Wouldn't life be better? For thou hast said in thine heart. Here's what he said inside. He didn't say it to anybody. It's his own heart. I will ascend into heaven. Now, if you'd like to mark your Bible, there's five I wills here. They're called the five I wills of Satan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. You might want to tie that in with Revelation where it calls Satan's seat, where his throne. Satan has a throne. Did he have a throne in heaven too? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Always a reference to other angels, stars or angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. He didn't want to get rid of God. He knows he can't. But he wants to sit on the throne of God with him. Who else is there? Christ. What does he want to be? He wants to be Christ. What is his man called? Anti-Christ. He wants to also sit on the mount of the congregation. He thinks he deserves to be where Christ is, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the cloud, the heights of the clouds. What is that? It's always about ascending, isn't it? First, it says, first, I will ascend. I will exalt I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You might recognize some of Satan's lies there. What happened? The Bible says, deceived and deceiving. He is deceived. He deceives himself. Obadiah chapter um, 1 and verse number something. <laughs> verse 3, I think it is. might be verse 4. I think it's verse 3. I'm right. Obadiah 1.3, it says, The pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the cleft of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Ooh, boy, powerful, powerful. Pride, what happened? Pride came in his heart. It said about a, a preacher, it says, Not a novice. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, Don't exalt a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, 
he fall into the condemnation of the devil. That pride, this is why we know the pride of life is inside of Satan, and he tries to get you with the pride of life. He got Eve, and he tried to get Christ, and he couldn't do it. The pride is welled up inside of him. Why? By reason of his own beauty, by the reason of, of, of his own splendor, he started to get prideful in his heart. What's Satan's rebellion? Look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. Um, well, if we look at 15b, we can finish his sin. Um, Ezekiel, we'll just go to Ezekiel 28, 15, and verse 17. It's the sin. It says, uh, um, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. What's the iniquity? The pride that was inside of him, the twisting of the truth, which brought forth the I wills that he said in his heart. He began to decide he was deserving of something better. God was truly withholding him something that was good. God was actually evil. He could be more than what he was created. This is your superhero movies. This is all you idiots that like to watch Captain America and wish you were the one getting changed into something beautiful. You want to be more than you are. Welcome to Satan's lie. I will be more than God has created. What do you think the superhero movies are so popular for? So you want to sit down and watch this kind of idiot stuff? Welcome to the lie of Satan. I will be more than God created me to be. Right? Might as well go get plastic surgery. <laughs> you end up looking like a freak. <laughs> you can't be more than God made you to be. Don't try to be. And don't wish you were. Right? That's the opposite of what we just studied in Sunday school. Contentment. Anyway, don't get me preaching. We gotta, we're studying. And it says... Uh, we got to finish it. His sin, verse 17, verse 15 says, iniquity was found inside of him, right? Puffed up, pride says. It puffs up. Verse 17 in Ezekiel 28 says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou was corrupted the by wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So we see what happened inside of him. I don't want to go to his judgment yet. Let's not finish that. Let's go over to his sinful actions, what he did. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 16, what did he do? He says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, thou hast filled the midst of thee with violence, and I, uh, and thou hast sinned. So what is this multitude of merchandise? And what is the idea of this merchandise that, that he does here? What does he do? And then it says over in verse number uh, 18, you know, thou, was def thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. What is that? What is this merchandise and traffic of Satan? Well, it says over there, we don't have time to go to it, Revelation chapter 12 tells us that the great dragon, who is Satan, that old serpent, who drew with his tail a third of the angels. So it's a third of the stars of heaven. He took a third of the angelic host to join him in his, his rebellion. How do you get an angel to rebel against God? They can see him. It's one of the reasons there's no redemption. They can watch him. They know who he is. How do you do it? Why are Satan's lies so powerful that an angel would choose to rebel against God and join Satan? And a third of them did. Why? What? Do you really think you can stand against Satan's lie in your heart? Oh, it's subtle. And oh, it draws. It's the superhero idea is part of it. It's God's evil, God withholding. It's, it's the free will. It's, 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 all, it's the creation of what life truly is, what it really means, and all the lies that are coming. Do you think you can stand against the lies of this world in your heart? Boy, you feel it, don't you? And you've got to fight against those lies in your heart. Why? Because his lies are powerful, powerful enough to draw a third of the angels after him. Was he upset? Did he hope it would be all? I think he hates the angels that didn't. Why is Michael afraid to stand against him? He says it's up to the Lord. What, ha what happened when Satan drew? Well, the story of Absalom is the greatest picture in the Bible of what happened there. What did Absalom do as he stood outside the court of his dad's courtroom? And anybody that came with a case, he said, hey, come over here. Talk to me. Talk to the prince. You don't need to see the king. I'll take care of this. And what did Absalom do? He drew a whole, how much of the kingdom did he draw behind him and brought forth a rebellion against his dad, cast, trying to cast his dad off the throne? How did it end for Absalom? The pretty Absalom with his long, beautiful, thick hair. And he ended up hanging by his hair. 
Who else ended up hanging? Judas, another Antichrist. How often can I find this theme through the Bible? And how did his beauty be his undoing? How many times has God told us the story that we missed it? <laughs> Let me tell you. So far, I've found dozens of Antichrists in our Bible, right? Wow. It's insane. It's there. God's tied the whole story together, and Satan knows the story. He, by the abundance of his traffic, went to angel, to angel, to angel, and said, we can defeat God. We can put him in a quandary. We can put him somewhere. He's infinite mercy. He's infinite judgment. He cannot bring those two things together. He has to forgive you if you sin. He has to judge you if you sin. He can't do both. We have free will. Do you really? Cast yourself down. You don't really have free will. God will send angels to protect you. God's not going to let you dash your foot against a stone. Are you the seed of this woman or not? Satan's lie comes in, right? Oh, the authority. God can't tell me what to do. Oh, I tell you what. Woo! The Bible and against God's word. Who does Satan think he's facing? Why did Jesus himself come down to fight? because he knew who he's battling. None of us can stand against him. A third of the angels couldn't stand against him. Why? His sin, his traffic. Want to study what that traffic is? Oh, guess what? Oh, you got to read Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8 when it talks about the Antichrist. When he comes, what he's going to do, it says, by the abundance of his traffic. What's the Antichrist going to come and do? Oh, you got to read it. We won't do it now. Oh, it's, listen, it's good. Don't you, do you ever do it in your Bible and go, oh, I, mean, I know you do, down deep, down deep. I know you do. So we can't read about the rest of it. Uh, it's it's seven, six, seven minutes after 12. Um, um, uh, let's just, just in closing, let's go, listen, it doesn't end well for Satan. <laughs> okay, it doesn't end well. All right, it doesn't end well. Um let me see what I can skip here. Let's go to Isaiah 14, verses 15 and 17. Isaiah 14, 15 and 17. God says, um, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Satan says, I will exalt. I will ascend. I will ascend. And God says, You're going to be brought down to hell. How many times is Satan brought down? Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven, Luke chapter 10, right? But he's still got access to heaven. Why? Because we know in Job, he's in heaven talking. We know he's still there. He travels back and forth. Where have you been? Traveling to and fro among the earth. And he goes back up to heaven when the assembly calls. We know he still has access. What happens in Revelation chapter 13? Michael and his angels fight against that old dragon. And he's cast out of heaven. He says, woe unto the earth, for Satan is cast out of heaven. Rejoice, ye saints, for the accuser of the brethren, which accused the brother day and night, is cast out of heaven. Heaven is purified during the book of Revelation. And Satan is cast down to the earth. We know he's down on the earth now. Woe to the earth. Then what? happens oh revelation chapter 20 comes along what happens a strong angel comes at him from heaven and he grabs that old satan that old serpent binds him in chains and throws him into the abyss the bottomless pit there he spends a thousand years and then he's let out for just a little season in chapter 20 right out from that bottomless becomes he's, he's gone down from his spot above god's throne he went down from heaven down to the earth then he's been thrown into the abyss below the earth and then he comes out just for a moment causes a rebellion and god comes down and grabs him and he says into the lake of fire. He goes down, he goes down, he goes down. Let me tell you, you start following Satan's lies. You start believing you're a superhero. You start wishing you were more than you were or somebody you're not. I tell you what, you're going down, you're going down, you're going down, you're going down. That's the devil's way. Down, 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 down. Man, follow the Lord, trust in him. God's got it all worked out, okay? He's going down. Ezekiel chapter 28 and in uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 19, uh, I want you to look at that. It says, uh, oh, it's, it's not just verse 19, 16 through 19. It says this, uh, By the multitude of thy merchandise, I was filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, now, if you are a Bible thumper scholar, love this kind of stuff, let me tell you, Satan says five I wills over there. You might notice there's five I wills here from God. <laughs> when Satan says, I will give this empire to anybody I want, do you think he's telling the truth? God says the earth is mine. 
I raise up kings. I put them down. Satan says, oh, no, no, it's mine. Jesus, I'll give you all the glory of these kingdoms because they're delivered to me and I give them to whom I will. Watch out for Satan's I will. He said, I'll ascend. He said, I will exalt. He said, I will ascend. He said, I will sit on the throne. He said, I will be at the sides of the north. I will be above the, side, the stars of heaven. And God says, oh, yeah? I will. Watch what God says. In verse number 16. And the multi it says, uh, we read half of it. It says, therefore, halfway through the verse, I, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. <laughs> I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Then he goes on and he talks about the, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuary by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. He's going to explode from the inside out. It will devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. <laughs> God's five I wills. Who do you think is going to win? Oh, isn't that good? God wins, friends. Let me tell you something. Satan, you're in trouble here. He's in the, he comes to the wilderness, and he's watching this man walk 60 miles. He hadn't eaten or drank anything. He's like, I wonder if this is it, man. I heard that voice from heaven. Is this the seed of the woman? And he walks up, and he faces him with all of his temptations, all of his lies. And what is the last words that Jesus says to Satan? Get thee hence. You might want to study those words out. Satan has no choice. How far did he fly? <laughs> and Satan is gone, <laughs> right? How, how long did it take him to fly back? <laughs> right? You might notice he says something to Judas when he gives him the sob. What thou doest, do quickly. Same words. Get out. And Judas stands up from that table after denying the love of Christ. And God looks at him, and Satan dwells him as soon as he gives him that special sop, which says, I love you, I care for you. you I, I'm offering you salvation right now, Judas. And Judas looks him in the face and says, no. And he gives him the sop, and Satan fills the heart of Judas. And it's, Jesus looked at him and said, get out. And it says, Satan in Judas went out into the darkness. Remember, he's God. He's in control. And Satan is learning something here in the garden, right? He's learning who he's facing. When does he learn? When does he figure it out? This is, I think he walks away with a pretty good idea. This is the seat of the woman. He wins, friends, right? Maybe we should sing I'm on the winning side, right? Let's sing that instead. I had a song picked out to sing at the end, you know, a nice sweet invitational. And, you know, if God's working in your heart today, by all means, pray. By all means, glorify the Lord. Uh, by, by all means, if you're not saved when you're watching or you're here, uh, you can get saved today. Don't trust those Satan's lies. Maybe one of them is in your heart. You want to be a superhero. You're a fool. You're a fool. You're, you're buying into Satan's lies. Don't buy into them. Get rid of that trash. Get, get it out of your life. Anything that has to do with uh, rebellion against authority, anything that has to do with uh, the, the, the free will and how it's going, or existence and atheism, and, and get that, that garbage out of your life, you're going to exist forever in heaven or hell. You don't die. You don't cease to exist when you die. Existence and life are not the same thing. Don't buy into the Satan's lie. But uh, if, you're, if you're a Christian today and you love the Lord, or if you just got saved today, you can sing, I'm on the winning side. Anybody see it in the book? You know what page it is? They say that God's people will sing better after the preaching than they ever do before the preaching. There's a lot of I'ms in our Bible. Page 272, let's sing page 272. If you want to worship God and just pray and thank him for who he, for what he's done and how he's put you on the winning side and your salvation, uh, just pray to God and, and praise him. If you want to stand and join me and sing this great song, God, we're on the winning side. Let's stand and sing. God's put us here. It's a great place to be. <clears throat> let's, not, let's not stand in awe of Satan. Let's stand in awe of God. Ready? Oh, once I drifted out in sin, had no hope for joy within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and He showed me I was wrong. Now I know I'm on the way. I'm on the wind side.
will never have to fear, for my Lord is ever near, and in Him so often I confide. He's the keeper of my soul, since I gave Him full control, and He lays me on the way. done. Thank you, Jesus, for winning the fight. Never any doubt, <laughs> but God, thank you for doing it. And now offering your hand to me to be saved, to get off the other team, Lord, to know the truth. God, help me to see the devil's lie in my life, how it weakens me. He's called the one that weakens the nations. God, help us to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, that we may put on the full armor of God and be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Lord, help us to be those people. Bless this church. Bless those folks here today and those in the sound of my voice, Lord. Bless them, I pray, with a rich understanding and a love for the Scripture and awe for the Word of God and a, and a thankfulness to the Lord Jesus for what He did for us. Thank you, Lord, for taking up our cause. Thank you. We love you. Bless now this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.